Welcome back to The Couple. Today I'm joined by Chris Adlam, uh, veteran decoupler, um, also uh, one of the co-founders of Canadians for Nuclear Energy and the massive brain behind a lot of the analysis that's uh, gone into fighting that campaign and, and writing our uh, reports, uh, both on Pickering and CanDo. Um, you did an episode with us, The Case for CanDo, which accompanied that report. Um, that was a big hit amongst the audience. So Chris, uh, it's great to have you back today. Oh, great to be here. And today, um, we decided we really needed to take a look at something that's a little bit Ontario-centric, um, the so-called Green Energy Act. Um, but I think we both feel that it has lessons you know, well beyond the borders here. Uh, bear with us. We will try and um, you know, disentangle every uh, acronym that we use. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's got broad applicability. Um, and given that Ontario is you know, such a focus and really a place of hope, uh, for nuclear within the uh, the Western world, um, this is the context into which we are heading now. As commodity prices go up and the cost of borrowing goes up, everyone always says the best time to build nuclear was ten years ago, um, and it definitely was. Uh, but we were busy doing other things. Uh, so, Chris, let's dive in. Green Energy Act. Uh, I think it was signed in two thousand and nine. What was it? Uh, it was essentially a Ontario, Ontarianized version of uh, the German energy wind. Um, Dalton McGuinty, Gerald Butts, um, that whole Liberal Party at the time was inspired by what was taking place in Germany. Uh, we were just coming out of a recession uh, and they thought they could use that to kickstart the economy in Ontario. Um, so they leveraged large contracts to subsidize wind and solar and biomass uh, capacity, uh, along with some gas, um, to potentially, or, or the idea was rather to, uh, to bring those industries to Ontario and make Ontario a manufacturing hub, um, and create green jobs in the province, uh, which did not materialize. Right. And, and I mean, Ontario, uh, you know, has been, I think it still is fair to say it's a, it's a manufacturing sort of center of the country, maybe alongside Quebec. Um, but yeah, the 2008, nine economic crisis uh, were a doozy and we did bail out the auto industry i think on both sides of the border here uh but i think you're saying that was a, a big part of the rationale was a sort of economic recovery program yeah right? there, we had companies like caterpillar um that left the left uh, the province um after the gea was enacted um there there were some some impacts of that but yeah essentially there was a dis- decline in demand which corresponded with the decline of of industry and the the economic issues that were taking place and the idea was that you know we would recover that and that ontario would be this this hub of green manufacture um unfortunately when those subsidies were removed um the companies immediately left ontario um and and it never developed into what it was claimed it was going to be which was you know that we would be exporting wind turbine parts and solar panels all over the world that that never happened Right, right. I think there was the promise of 50,000 green jobs and I think some protectionist measures as well, right? I think. Um, yes. So there were some of the early that? contracts had requirements um, for domestically sourced components, which is why these companies, well, it was to incentivize these companies to set up shop here in Ontario so that, you know, the parent companies could be bidding on the contracts. Um, and the contracts themselves were, of course, extremely lucrative. Um, and once that requirement was removed, which was later on, those companies just packed up shop because um, they could then build those projects and get those lucrative contracts without the domestic materials requirement. Right. No, I mean, I, I had a friend uh, at the time, and this was before um, I'd gone on this energy journey and deep dive. Um, and uh, he was uh, working a lot of these contracts with Chinese investors and others. Um, and you know, the community I was a part of really held this guy up. He was kind of a hero, uh, part of the energy transition, um, helping get this stuff built. He was getting fabulously wealthy. Oh, yeah, he um, would have been. Which was, was it nice solar? Effect, but uh, it was mostly solar. Yeah. yeah. So tell, tell us a bit more. I mean, what are feed-in tariffs? I understand they originated in Germany. What are they as a mechanism and, and how did that play out in Ontario? So the, con- the, the concept is very simple. You get paid a uh, premium rate um, for however many kilowatt hours that you export to the grid. Um, so let's say you're buying electricity uh, around the time that the G, well, around the time that um, this was enacted and we had the market and all that stuff was sort of foisted on the province, uh, retail rates were around five cents. So if you were buying power 
uh, from the grid, you would be buying it at five cents. And the feed-in tariffs for solar were 60 to 80 cents. And so small residential installs would receive up to 80 cents per kilowatt hour for, our, which was, you know, a gold mine. You, and uh, so this was actively pursued. Um, the other part of this um, were the wind contracts, which weren't quite as lucrative, um, but it's like 90 some odd percent of them. I can't remember what the exact figure is, but it's like 94% of the wind contracts went to the Liberal Party's uh, donors, um, which didn't have very good optics. Um, and they started calling them wind contracts, like Kathleen Wynne, um, by the time she was in power after McGinty. <laughs> Uh, also didn't help things. Um, but yeah, those, those early feed in tariffs, um, were, were a windfall, uh, for whoever could afford to, to invest in it at the time. I remember you showing me, uh, I think it was a spreadsheet, um, of some of the beneficiaries. Um, a lot of kind of fossil fuel subsidiaries were involved. T tell me a bit more about who well, one was, of the uh, earliest, um, uh, wind developers in the province was Enbridge. A name we should all recognize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> For the international listeners, that's a gas company. Yeah, yeah. and and so that was the case with uh, the vast majority of the wind contracts. Either went directly to fossil fuel companies uh, or to companies that were fossil fuel adjacent or affiliated. Um, and there might be a couple uh, corporate levels there where it's like, oh, well, there's no direct affiliation. But then you're like, oh, look, it's the parent company. Um, that is in fact invested in fossil fuels. Uh, and that's a common theme for every one of the, almost every one of the wind contracts, especially the large ones. You know, it, it's interesting. Politically, the world seems really topsy-turvy and upside down. Um, we currently have a conservative government um, that is investing more in publicly owned power generation than, you know, any government going back, I'm not sure, four or five terms. Um, and under um this liberal government earlier and i'm not trying to be partisan here but it's just interesting you know typically the left would be associated with investing in public ownership etc um this seems like it was a pretty large-scale privatization privatization effort it was a huge privatization effort uh and they were pulling away and so th th there's a relation to this to the whole market philosophy um you know, brief backstory but of course ontario hydro was broken up um and um, created these separate entities, Ontario Power Generation being the one that inherited all the generating assets. Um, and part of the whole growing the market was to grow private um, generating sources and to reduce the, the share that, that OPG occupied. Um, so there was this reluctance uh, to invest in, in anything uh, public, which seemed bizarre by a, you know, a government that we traditionally uh, view as left. Um, but if you go back further, Darlington, Pickering, Bruce, those were all built by conservative governments. So uh, there is this history of, of conservative support for um, public power in Ontario. It's just not necessarily something that we would view as synonymous with, con with the more modern view of conservatism. Right. Um, but there is that, that legacy. So it's, it's not as unusual as you would get at, at first or think at their first glance. Right. But yeah, so, you know, we signed tens of thousands of private contracts for generation. We have more than five gigawatts of wind, um, which is, you know, massive. The Darlington B project was canceled, um, which would have been an investment in public power. Um, of course, the cancellation of the Pickering A refurbishment after units one and four were done, the cancellation of the Pickering B refurbishment also happened. So again, canceling investment in public infrastructure and moving that money over into uh, private investment. Um, the other thing was it allowed the government to avoid spending public monies and instead, you know, it was pushed directly onto the ratepayer via, via these contractual obligations, right? You know, we as ratepayers had to cover those contract costs, so it wasn't you still do wasn't yeah, well. That's just it, right? <laughs> that's it, not past twenty tense. year contracts, <laughs> which were then extended or reamortized over thirty to reduce their impact, and now eighty five percent of those contract costs have been shifted to the tax base 
to keep them off our hydro bills because the impact was so dramatic. And I remember getting an argument with somebody um, who was like, oh, it's only 478 megawatts of solar in the province. There's no way that had an impact on hydro bills. No, there's not. There's there's 2.2 gigawatts of rooftop solar or and wow. small scale solar in the province on top of the 470 watt megawatt, 478 megawatts of grid tied solar. Right? So there's more than two and a half gigawatts of solar. And the average rate for solar is almost 50 cents a kilowatt hour. That's considerable. The, the thing is, you don't see that in the grid mix because it's embedded. Right. So it doesn't show up in the ISO supply mix. It's there. It depresses demand during the day. So it, it manifests as a re, as a reduction in, in demand that we're not seeing. Um, but there's a considerable cost to it. So, you know, even though it's invisible looking at the IASO website, it is not invisible in terms of the cost. And the other thing is with is with wind power producing out of phase with demand. Right. It's most productive in the spring and in the fall. When Ontario demands in the toilet, which is exactly when we schedule our nuclear outages, right? Because we have surplus hydro in the spring. So we've got lots of generating capacity. So we shut down a couple of nuclear units, do some maintenance breaks, you know, make sure everything's ready for that summer peak, which is our peak period. And we, then we do the same thing in the fall, right? Make sure like Pickering 8's off right now, getting maintenance done to it. Bruce 4 is off right now, getting maintenance done to it. Those units will be reloaded before the cold really sets in so that we have reliable power over the winter. Meanwhile, and that's a really, that's a really, we've got wind producing, that's a really you know, at 40% capacity, 40, 50% capacity when we don't need the power. So it either gets curtailed, which we then pay full price for. It's part of those lovely lucrative contracts. Or we dump it on the US, you know, at half a cent per kilowatt hour while we pay the full contract cost as rate payer. So it was... It was a delicious scheme uh, cooked up. Yeah. I mean, it's it's no wonder that it was so popular at the time, right? People were scrambling to get these contracts because they were so lucrative. Just get rich quick, exactly. Yeah. But it completely screwed the rate payer. So and, and so in terms of in terms of getting a sense of that overall cost, um, I think you probably it's ran sixty three billion um, dollars. Um, that's billion. just the rate cost that doesn't, that doesn't include amor- reamortization. It doesn't include, int- it doesn't include interest. It doesn't include an inflation adjustment, which there is. So there's an inflation escalator baked, baked into every single one of those contracts. So if you go back and you look at the average cost of wind and solar five years ago in, in the province, right? Even though we haven't signed any new contracts, all those costs have gone up. Because they're ratcheted with inflation. So those contract costs will continue to escalate. So I took the average cost, the average 2023 cost, and just applied it to the amount of kilowatt hours generated over the anticipated life of those assets, and we get $63 billion. In reality, the cost will be considerably higher because of that inflation adjustment, which is more than we paid for our entire nuclear fleet, which produces 60% of our electricity, and this produces about yeah. wealth. And that that's only to the midlife refurbishment point. And we have correct. Yeah, we have another fifty plus years yeah. out of those assets. Okay, so let's just let's just get those numbers side by side. I think the you know twenty twenty one dollar value of our entire nuclear fleet was about fifty eight billion yep. and sixty three billion. As you said for the contract, conservatively, cost. just the contract costs. Yeah. It's what we pay for the generation. And we do don't you own do those a sense assets, of what right? the the ratio is between power produced by the nuclear versus the uh, the GA contract. So current year is probably not the best example because we have units offline for refurbishment at both sites. But even using the current year, nuclear and hydro provides seventy six percent of our supply at fifty eight percent of our cost. In comparison, wind, solar, and biomass are twelve percent of our supply. And thirty-one percent of our supply cost, which is unreal. It's interesting that shift to the tax base because um, you know what what the ratepayer pays is actually a pretty regressive tax because poor households have inefficient appliances, and as a percentage of their um, their income, they they spend more on electricity, whereas rich folks have nicer appliances and bigger income, so they they spend proportionately less. Shifting it to a uh, you know, a progressive tax base, I guess it does shift the load a little bit more onto people who earn a bit more uh, income. 
But uh, I remember talking to uh, Edgardo Sepulveda, um, who's been a frequent guest on the podcast, although not for a while. Um, and, you know, in Ontario, we've got healthcare, number one budget item. But I think down number six line item is, is long-term care. And, and these, um, these subsidy costs are, are just below that. Um, I think it's, what, 3, 3.5 3.1 billion? 3.1 billion uh, was the previous period. I think it's, it's up from that now. And yeah, that's just subsidizing 85% of the wind and solar contract costs, which is unreal, considering how little of our, our power they actually produce. And the other thing is, is if you look at that 12%, right? Solar, it's, I mean, besides the fact it's obscene, at least solar tends to produce in phase with demand. You know, it's most productive in the summer, which is when our demand is the highest. But wind is most productive when we don't need it. So most of those kilowatt hours, which are reflected in the supply mix, are unneeded. You know, we're spilling hydro. So Ontario, so, you know, you have OPG bypassing the dams and then we pay for the spilled waters. The other thing. <laughs> so, so we're paying to not produce power at back in the other hydro stations so that we allow wind on the grid, which we didn't need, which we then pay a premium for. And then we're also paying for standby gas capacity. Uh, it's just a gong show. So wind used to have first right on the grid, right? Yes, it that, did. So, so what did that do to our nuclear fleet? So that was <laughs> – so Bruce Power uh, is the only one that undertook this um, – flexible operation profile. So uh, Pickering and Darlington both run 100% baseload. So they just, reactors just run at a constant level all the time. They're capable of doing maneuvers, but OPG does not do maneuvers with them. So it's not that the units aren't capable of load following, they are. Uh, Specifically Darlington, that was actually baked into the requirement for the plant, but um, they don't because the the OPEX for the plants are the lowest when they're running in in 100% baseload. Bruce is a contracted facility. It's owned by OPG, but it's operated by Bruce Power, who also assumes all the operating costs and upgrades and all of that stuff. So they figured that they would offer in this flexible operation so they can curtail up to 2,400 megawatts of capacity across all eight units. Yeah, it's considerable. Um, so because wind had first to grid rights at Bruce, they'd start steaming off power, dumping potential electricity right into the lake as heat to allow wind on the grid at more than double the cost of the power coming out of the Bruce, situ- the Bruce plant, which is, you know, insane. But, and, and I've actually seen and interacted with a few people in the UK that believe that first to grid rates for wind make sense. It, how? You have generating source that shows up completely randomly. Why would it have priority? Why should it have priority? over a source that's already there that has lower life cycle emissions. It, there's, there's no real argument there other than somebody just prefers wind. Like why would you turn off a 4.9 gram per kilowatt hour or CO2 per kilowatt hour source to allow a 12 gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour source on the grid right. that just shows up out of nowhere. There, there's no rhyme or reason to do that. Were there actual, because I'd heard that there were actually nuclear units going offline. They, you know, take two or three days to come back online. No, they never took units offline. Um, I mean, there's the potential for that to happen. Like if they had to curtail more than 2,400 megawatts, they could take a unit offline. But not at Bruce. They wouldn't, uh, they would try to avoid that if at all possible. They'd just curtail more, more capacity across more units. I mean, 2,400 megawatts is a lot. So in terms of, uh, this is another kind of interesting point, like observing the Ontario nuclear fleet. And as you said, the outage is happening in, in the low demand seasons. People say nuclear is inflexible. Um, it's not going to play well in the grid because it's just this constant base load. But when you have a fleet, you do the maintenance when demand is low and you go gangbusters when it's high. So it's kind of, it's interesting when it's averaged over 18 units. Um, there is a lot of flexibility. Oh, absolutely. Possible. Right. And especially with the can-do units, right? You don't have refueling outages. So you just, you know, run the units till you, you know, you're not going to need capacity or as much capacity and you just take the units that are going to need maintenance offline. And you, you know, you, because you have such a large fleet, you can really uh, manage that schedule quite, quite well. And then, so you don't end up with surplus base load and you make sure you do have sufficient capacity for your peak periods, which are both the summer and the winter. 
I don't want to get too much into sort of name calling, but um, and bringing up names that you know won't be of relevance to the international audience. But um, one name that comes up uh, is Amory Lovins. Um, he came oh, up yes. and I think did some consulting. So just walk us through a little bit of the kind of intellectual authorship um, of this. I mean, this this sounds calamitous. Policymakers make ridiculously stupid decisions so this energy actually all the time. Predates the GEA considerably. Uh, okay. we're, we have to go back into the nineties, um, to look at Lovins's influence, um, which is actually, I would say more far reaching, uh, than what we saw with the GEA. Um, you know, the, the soft path, right. Which is all about you know, distributed generation and reducing demand. And, um, that's incompatible with building large infrastructure. Right, those they're two completely different things. So uh, Murray Strong, who was the chairman of Ontario Hydro, uh, appointed under Bob Ray during the the Ray days um, of the NDP, one time NDP had power in Ontario. Uh, he decimated the finance. This is for the international audience, this is our sort of uh, left social democratic kind of Labour Party, uh, and that was the only government they ever formed. They're usually in opposition and occasionally have influence in kind of minority government setups. But anyway, just just for context there. So um, Maury Strong was heavily influenced by Levins. And so his stewardship of Ontario Hydro reflected that. Um, so it did not receive adequate investment. Uh, nuclear performance tanked. Uh, the only plant that was really able to weather it properly was Darlington because it was brand spanking new at the time. Um, Bruce B kind of did okay because it was the second most recent plant. Bruce A was just completely laid up because it was a gong show. Um, and Pickering A was laid up, um, as well. So we were down eight units, uh, <laughs> and that, and burning what, some more coal back then, right? Well, so, you know, Ontario Hydro had this huge fleet, right? They're public generator. So they have massive amount of capacity that was either under or completely not, not really utilized. So we were peaking previously with coal. Uh, we had the North America's largest coal plant in Nanticoke. And so when the nuclear assets were, you know, uh, had their performance decimated, coal stepped in because you can pass the operating cost of the coal units directly onto the rate payer. You don't have this, um, the, the same staffing levels and the same maintenance levels that you do at a nuclear facility due to regulation, and, uh, you know, the requirements, right? Um, so we saw this resurgence um, of coal use in the province. Um which was, you know, the the parties later agreed that all like it was a pan party agreement that we would need to phase out coal, but that had been Ontario's hydro's goal with the nuclear phase out or sorry, the nuclear rollout from the get go. I mean, Pickering was built instead of a coal plant, so right. the uh, the a big coal plant. Yeah, like we had a yeah four gigawatt coal plant, right? A, a plant comparable in size to Nanico. Um. And the reason being is we had control over the fuel supply. It produced cheaper electricity. And even then, they knew that there were environmental impacts. Right? So that was why there was going to be Darlington B. That was why there was going to be Bruce C and D. You know, Ontario Hydro had very ambitious plants. There was going to be Wesleyville. There were going to be, you know, all of these other nuclear plants to completely replace coal. And then that was all completely undone. And so then we... You know, there was the, the breakup of Ontario Hydro under Harris um, because we decided that for whatever reason, we were going to embrace this market ideology. Um, but then after the breakup, of course, we, we elected the Liberals. Um, and they were the ones who actually privatized Hydro One. So Harris didn't actually privatize anything. He set the stage for the privatization and buggered up Ontario Hydro. Um, but nothing was actually privatized other than the operation of Bruce Power. Um, and it's still a publicly owned asset. It's just privately operated. Um, but yeah, it was, it was actually the more left-leaning party that did the privatization, which is a bit odd. But, um, but things have never been the same since the breakup of Ontario Hydro. Right, right. It's, it's interesting because you know, people make uh, a lot of hay about you know, having a nuclear station that's relatively urban. I mean, you can uh, see suburbs maybe 500 meters from the the fence or even closer at Pickering. Um, you know, but that was supposed to be a four gigawatt coal plant. Yep. Like, and and the you know, like and the day to day coal plants impact right in Toronto, right? 
Wow. Right down on the harbor. Yeah. Big smoke. Yeah. That's what it was called. So, I mean, why would you be okay? And, and coal plants emit tons of radioactive emissions by virtue of the ash that comes out of them, right? Right, right. So they're more dangerous the than major... the new plant. Considerably more dangerous. Right. They don't have the same safety regulations. They're not as stri- safe. They're not as strictly regulated. And, you know, you think of the amount of emissions that, you know, Pickering and Darlington and Bruce have avoided. So, yes, this choice to build this non-emitting plant directly adjacent to our largest load center was, you know, was beneficial. There was there were no real detractors. I mean, the the reason uh, the plants in Ontario have this vacuum building, which is this additional layer of safety and protection, and the plants are not allowed to operate without the vacuum building being in service. It was so that they could be built so close to the population and the load centers. That was intentional. So my sense is that, uh, you know, the capacity that was built out in the Green Energy Act, it wasn't, you know, demand was down. We just had the global economic crisis. This wasn't because we needed a bunch of power generation on the grid. This was more planned for economic stimulus, kind of a nice to have, kind of a frill. So now we're in a situation, you know, 10 years later um, that we're seeing demand forecasts skyrocketing, uh, immigration, reindustrialization, reshoring of industry, the battery plants, the electric arc furnaces. Um, and man, the 2010s, what a great decade. Uh, interest rates, you know, going negative at a point. Um, coal, gas, uh, uranium, uh, dropping peak to trough 90% in cost. I mean, this was, what a decade it was. And, you know, what a shame that we weren't doing any nuclear at that point. Yeah, well, so we should we're have been stinging. building Darlington B. We're stinging for, and refurbing Pickering back then. That yep. would have that would have been a bit cheaper, um, but uh, yeah, now we're we're stinging from this uh, this financial stress of sixty two billion dollars for some pretty low value. Well, and you brought up a good point. You're saying now that now demand has increased or is increasing, right? But all of this generation that we built doesn't satisfy that demand because it produces out of phase with demand. The largest thing we built were the, was the wind capacity, which doesn't produce when we need it. So it has like zero value for this massive cost. Can't run a factory without baseload. I think that's uh baseload may be, maybe a myth if, uh, you know, you want to live in mud huts and um, I don't know, enjoy the solar economy, but uh, um, it does seem like a real challenge. Um, you know, so yeah, I guess, I guess looking forward, I mean, is there anything else that you wanted to, uh, to kind of add or reflect upon in, in terms of this GA experience? Um, I mean, it's um, just, let's, I mean, we should, fi- we should finish the story in terms of the electoral outcomes. Um, oh, yeah. But, well, yeah. I mean, what happened? What, people got upset. <laughs> what was going on there? So, yeah, I mean, there were there were a couple of things that happened during the the Win and Mag- McGinty days. Uh, one of them was the coining of the term hallway health care, uh, which, you know, given your occupation, I'm sure you're well aware of. Uh, we had patients lining hallways because there weren't beds. Um, and the other was, of course, heat or eat. And that was the dramatic impact that the wind and solar contracts had on electricity rates, which then people, you know, heating with electric baseboard, um, which didn't make up a a large portion of the population, but it was enough, um, made, you know, running their electric heaters unaffordable. And so which is where that came from. Um, You know, that ultimately led to the decimation of the Ontario Liberal Party, um, which became known as the minivan party because they had seven seats. Um, so the, <laughs> the repercussions came fast and hard. Um, you know, the, the rate pair hit their breaking point and just wiped out the party. And, you know, that's, that's a warning um, for other parties. And I think we see that playing out with the, with the current conservative government He's very, he's trading very carefully on the electricity file. And that's why they're, you know, trying to, they've stabilized rates. And yes, it's, they're being subsidized, but people don't see their bills going up. And so it's, it's ironic that Ontario has gone from one of the most expensive jurisdictions in North America to now being one of the lowest price jurisdictions in North America. Yes, there's subsidy, but our, our rates, when the GA was canceled, that stopped the bleeding. Our rates stopped increasing at that point, and so we're just. So talk, of- talk about that. Talk about that. You, you mentioned the election um, again. A majority party in parliament. You know, real um, natural party of government, as we call them. Usually, it'll go liberal, conservative, liberal, conservative. 
uh, just decimated. I think that's, you know, they lost official party status, minivan party, as you said. Um, and I think one of the first things that the incoming Ford government did was, was cancel the Green Energy yeah, Act. Yeah, well, that was their electoral received. promise, that they would, they would cancel the Green Energy Act, which had outraged everybody, um, and, and return to, to sensible policy. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing, you know, the announcement of the refurbishment of Pickering. That's a sensible announcement, investing in a generator that enabled us to get off of coal, right? Bruce C, again, generator, the return to service of Bruce A provided 70% of the electricity we needed to replace coal in the province. That's massive. So if it's, if it's doing that, and if we want to phase out gas, you do the exact same thing, right? We, hence the investment in the SMRs at Darlington, hence the Bruce C. You know, these are big projects that we know can deliver deep decarbonization. And you, you look, have to look no further than Europe. You look at France, even in the grips of their reactor outage binge due to those uh, leaking pipes, they were still massively greener than Germany. And the, the, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that Germany spent on wind and solar. And, you know, that, that's success. And we were able to emulate that success here in Ontario with our nuclear fleet. So we'd be absolutely stupid not to do the same thing over again and just continue on that path, which we know works. And there has been no major economy that is decarbonized with wind and solar. It's either hydro, hydro plus nuclear, or nuclear. France. A little geothermal in, in Iceland. Yeah, right? well, right yes, that's their one. <laughs> Volcanoes going off right now. <laughs> Random off, off example there, but yes. Yeah. So, so I mean, there's definitely the, the rate on the, the impact on the rates. Um, you know, I understand also that the wind turbines, um, you know, engendered some resistance just maybe on an aesthetic basis or certainly in farming communities. I mean, I've driven from the Bruce, which is surrounded by wind turbines at night and, you know, there are wind turbines everywhere Yes, and those little red lights are flashing all night long. I mean, I used to drive past that on my way to do a, you know, family medicine, uh, elective when I was in my residency and I would drive past them and say, these things are kind of ugly, but you know, this is the future. This is how we save the planet. Obviously, my position has changed somewhat, but it, you know that that flashing—I don't know—people dismiss that. Um, the the Jesse Jenkins, or I'm, I'm blanking on some of the names, where they say people who resist wind are just old cranky white men. Well, you, know, you brought up a good point there too, right? Because uh, there were groups like Wind Concerns Ontario that were spawned you know, from this opposition um, and and wanted the communities to be informed of the potential impact of having these near them, and you know there are impacts. They, uh, you build them on shale, they cause problems with water table. So like, these are real, real issues. Um, and yeah, people don't like the aesthetic either. Um, you know, do you want an industrial power plant in your backyard when you're living in the country? You know, if you buy a house directly adjacent to Pickering, you've made a decision to buy a house adjacent to a plant that's been there for 50 years. You know, if you have a farm and all of a sudden neighbor behind you puts up five giant wind turbines, that wasn't a decision that you've made, right? You weren't part of that, that decision-making process. So I can understand that opposition. Um, and full disclosure, my mom uh, was a member of a group that opposed wind development on the Tantramar Marsh uh, when they lived out east for the same reason. She didn't want wind turbines behind their house. She thought they were ungodly. So, um, I mean, yeah, there's there are le- legitimate opposition. Um, but yeah, your mention of of saving the saving the planet there i got into a discussion with somebody a couple of years ago um and it was really interesting and it was it was spurred by uh my comment that ontario's wind turbines were at the time a net load on the grid because i think they were producing 20 megawatts um which is less than it's required to, to run their cooling systems and um and keep them operating and this girl replied to me she's like well that's impossible the ones behind my house are spinning right now and I asked her what, what the name of the, the wind farm was. Oh, it's producing zero. And she's like, well, that's, no, no, that's, that's not possible. Like when they're spinning, they're produce they're avoiding gas and they're producing valuable electricity. I'm like, no, they're not. And I sent her the link to the Sigration site and she could view that the turbines behind her house were in fact producing absolutely nothing. And she... <laughs> You know, that was a, a revelation for her that, you know, just because it's spinning doesn't mean it's producing valuable electricity. And she didn't realize. How does that, that work, though? I mean, that that's counterintuitive to me. So what's, what's going on? But there's free will. Okay. Yeah, they, they don't cut in. They're, they're not 
they're not coupled to the turbine when there's not enough wind to produce electricity. Uh, so they just draw okay. from the grid. Jesus. So they have a cut in speed and they have a cut out speed too, right? If the wind gets too fast, then they have to put on the brakes. You do these analyses, uh, you know, where you compare Pickering's output to the, the wind fleet's output. But yeah, it started um, with Darlington, just, just, actually. To, just to drive home, though, this uh, incredible mismatch. I mean, again, we're a summer peaking grid. Um, what, what's the kind of peak and trough of our grid? And just paint a, like a more granular picture of what the hell's going on in summer. Because, you know, in terms of this reindustrialization, um, you know, we're not going to phase blackouts all year round because we don't have generation. But my understanding is we'd have to load shed some factories um, during the summer if if we have insufficient generation. So so paint that picture out for us a little more, a little more clearly. I mean, I, I can just simply point. say that during the, the peak summer period, Pickering at 3.1 gigawatts produces five times the electricity of our five gigawatt new wind fleet. That's the reality five times more productive despite having a lower nameplate capacity and wind has gotten as low as 6.8 percent capacity over a two-week period that's not like oh one day it wasn't productive no we're talking two weeks a two-week span where it produced less than seven percent so like a summer duncan flaute for uh for ontario (laughs) yeah exactly it's it's producing less electricity than one unit at pickering Okay, so the contracts are canceled. Um, there's a penalty to that, and that's often brought up as uh, as being kind of scandalous, or you know, uh, you'll hear a lot in the media about um, you know the fact that we're in a power lurch had to do with those uh, contracts being canceled. How, how do you respond? All to right, that? so there's two points on that. First off, p- people are pegging this capacity that was canceled as as if it would prevent us from burning gas because we're burning more gas right now um, due to the refurbishment outages. That's nonsense. We're talking in tens of megawatts. Like the variation that we see in seasonal output on a Darlington unit is more than what that capacity would have delivered to the grid. It's it's wholly inconsequential. There wasn't enough capacity that was canceled to be of value. Secondly, canceling the contracts was cheaper than allowing them to run to term, right? I think it was, what, 300 million or something like that to cancel the contracts and to let those that contracted capacity run would have been like 680 million. So it was a net savings. For capacity we didn't need because a lot of it was wind, which again produces out of phase with demand. So no value. We're going to be doing um, like a follow up Pickering episode. Um, we are all sort of uh, uh, what's the word? Um, we're not white knuckling because I think we're pretty confident um, of good news on the Pickering refurbishment file, but we're a little impatient. Um, oh, yes, absolutely. So it's been a year. <laughs> it's been a year. It's been a year. Um I don't know. I think we're wrapping up on the GA unless there's something else you wanted to mention. But just, um, um, well, there's just one thing I'd like to mention. People often trot out LCOE to, to argue that wind and solar projects are cheaper. Right? So they're not considering the production profile in that. And they're not considering oftentimes that those numbers are American. Like the most recent wind farm that was built in Ontario, it was Nation Rise. And somebody was like, oh, wind's a million dollars a megawatt. Nation Rise was $2.33 million a megawatt. That's considerably more, right? And then the same thing, you can do that for Nantico Solar, which we have the actual cost for because it's a public project. OPG did it. So, you know, there's this massive chasm between these LCOE figures and what projects actually cost in Ontario. And people are being misled by these LCOE figures and say, oh, you know, nothing's cheaper than solar or nothing's cheaper than wind. Solar produced 1.1% capacity yesterday. It peaked at 26 megawatts. Oh, batteries. Okay, what are four hours of batteries, which are what most of these large installs that get trotted out. What are four hours of battery going to do when you peaked at 26 megawatts? Nothing. What are you going to charge them with? Well, it's, yeah, you're not, <laughs> right? And same with the two weeks of, of no wind in the summer. right? The, uh, to firm all of this, and to bring it up to the level of a reliable generator, we're talking tens of billions of dollars, you know, multiples of the price of building a nuclear plant. So that needs to be considered. And I have roughly modeled that in the past using real numbers. And that's how I the price comparison the of <laughs> this was the price comparison of uh, of a Pickering refurb versus building wind and solar. Correct. To, to yeah. try and, and I had somebody. Come I mean, at it just me. gets absurd. So I had somebody come at me going, "Well, that does, that's not LCOE." 
And I'm like, I don't care about LCOE. I care about what real project cost. Well, you should be using LCOE. No, I'm going to use real project costs. I'm not going to use fictional numbers. I'm going to use real numbers. If you don't like the real numbers, find me a project that has real numbers that are more to your liking. And of course they can't. The same thing with the battery projects, right? You look at all of these battery installs in Australia and I, I use a blended cost um, based off Hornsdale. I'm, oh, well, the, the new ones are cheaper. No, they're not. You look at the completed battery projects and they are in line or even more expensive than Hornsdale. So, the, you know, you, you aren't seeing this cost decline that's claimed to be happening. Just like we're not seeing projects, you know, that are aligned with LCOE being, you know, being installed in Ontario. I mean, I think this is going to be a bit of a decade of disappointment, um, given the expectations really across the board for for clean tech, whether that's wind, solar, batteries, nuclear, it's all getting more expensive. Uh, absolutely. And and we, we've up. seen that with Commodities offshore wind in up. the States, right? The, the These cancellations of these offshore wind contracts, because, you know, the the um, the agreement was not um, generous enough to cover the capex for the for the project. Because all the materials got more expensive. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I do really worry for, um, you know, we're, we're again, we're the furthest ahead, I think, in the Western world, um, certainly in the SMR front. Well, we yeah, have an but... advantage here in Ontario just because we have OPG. You know, we have this, this public champion um, who, if we go back to the Ontario Hydro days, you know, Darlington was built during a time of absolutely insane interest rates. So was, so was Bruce B. So, you know, we've been in that environment before and we had this champion of public power that was able to pull through and produce something that we're still using today. You know, if you're relying on the market and you're relying on private investors, mm, what's going to get built, right? It has to make sense. Whereas, you know, you can public, these public utilities will do the long game. Interesting. And uh, on the finance front, we just won the uh, federal green bond. Absolutely. And, uh, We've got nuclear in the federal green bond, uh, which uh, I thought would be a lot harder than getting nuclear in the provincial green bond, but uh, still still waiting on that. <laughs> I think that domino is going to fall very shortly. Um, anyway, Chris, that was a great summary. Uh, we don't need to beat a dead horse or belabor the point. Um, I think we uh, got a good sense of um, the Green Energy Act. Uh, you know, again, just what a good time it was to to build, uh, build some energy projects and uh, sounds like we built the wrong ones. Yeah, it should have been Darlington B and it should have been those Pickering refurbishments. I mean, the only reason we're not running Pickering A past 2024 is because it's down two units. And those two units aren't, you know, able to be resurrected um, in a financially reasonable way at this juncture. Okay, Chris, great having you back. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back again fairly soon. Wonderful. Thank you.